Welcome back to Score the Podcast, presented by Spitfire Audio. We're joined by Oscar-winning composer A.R. Rahman. And this is one of the coolest projects. This is uh, a super band that was started called Super Heavy, and it included A.R. himself, Mick Jagger, uh, I mean, the, the Damian Marley. I'm really curious how something like this comes together because it's it, it, like the top artists of so many different genres, and um, there, not a lot of projects happen like this. AR, what was the genesis of uh, Super Heavy coming together? Uh, I think for me, Dave Stewart, you know. Um, mm -hmm. So Dave Stewart was a friend of Shaker Kapoor, one of my friends who directed uh, Elizabeth the Golden Age and Bandit Queen. Mm. And we met in London and Dave was introduced to me and then Dave called me and said, uh, AR, I want to form a band. I've got Mick Jagger with dinner in front of me. Are you willing? And I was like, yes. <laughs> I don't know what my role was. <laughs> I'm and, sure a lot uh, of people so have that dream though. That, how do you just call up <laughs> yes. Mick Jagger and say, do you want to start a new band? He's got a pretty good band going. Yeah. So that happened and so I was asking, what, what am I going to do? So you know what, you can, you can play, you can sing, you can do some arrangements and I said, fine. And what happened was, I'd, um, there was a fl the floods here and there was a Bombay shooting happened, the horrible mm -hmm. thing which happened in oh, uh, yeah. 2008. And then my, my sound engineer passed away, oh, no. who was close to me for 18 years, you know, and I was in a void and I was like, I want you to get out of this place. It's, it feels like doomsday for me here. First of all, this Bombay thing and this floods here into my studio and my engineer passing away and I need to get out. And exactly, you know, super heavy sessions happened in Henson Studios that time. And so I, I just took the flight. I was jet lagged, I was sitting there and I was seeing Damien Marley and his folks and I could smell cannabis and, <laughs> and hear living in four different corners of the studio, I had four different cultures. And this side was Dave Stewart with his guitar rig, uh, you know, huge amounts of guitars. And there was Josh Stone and, and I in was like, feet. what am I doing here? <laughs> but um, the most liberating thing was uh, that actually that one incident, that one experience with, with, with the lovely artists like Joss and Damien and Dave and Mick. Uh, I used to compose with my headphones on. I would never allow anyone to listen to what I was doing. At least 18 years, you know, I was so conscious about everything. When, when that, actually, that session opened up everything. And I felt like there's something new happening here. And this was before the Oscars. Mm -hmm. Just four, five, three months before the Oscars. And then I was, and uh, yeah, I think two months before the Oscars. All this happened, no nomination, nothing was announced. And the second or, oh, yeah, I think the first five days we, we did was write, 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 write. So I'd be playing the continuum or playing a groove or playing something, a chord progression. And, and then it went silent. And then we came back a year later and then tried to finish all the songs. And I was on the board of Paul Allen. He was kindly mm. hosted us. And we, I think, did a part, part of overdubs in the studio, in the, in the yacht, on oh, the, wow. you know, the beaches of uh, Greece and Turkey and Rome and I think Italy. So that was a pure rock star uh, experience. You yeah, know? yeah private, I imagine. Private jets and choppers going on. What was it like working with Mick Jagger? Did you guys spend a lot of time together? Not that much, but whatever we, whatever little we spent, uh, I learned a lot from him. I learned that age is just a number, mm. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. and use uh, age is just a number, and and the drive to do music, and even at that age, you know, like even have achieving cult status, being a perfectionist. He would just warm up for like a, an hour before even coming near the mic, even in the yard. Wow. And I was fascinated by all that stuff. I was like, oh, this is what makes them going. Yeah. They have a discipline it's, and which... It's did he teach you rare. any dance moves? 
yeah, is my it, question. Sorry? Did he teach you any dance moves is my question. <laughs> His dance moves are the most unique, right? Um, <laughs> no. I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the, I'm one thing which I'm really bad in life is dancing. That's what my wife says, so. Oh, never do that. <laughs> yeah, we watched the video together, and he's dancing. I think you're sitting in a car at one point. Yeah, and, <laughs> convenient. Um, but we assume that you are dancing inside the car. I love the fact that you're doing that on Paul Allen's yacht and being on <laughs> jets and how I guess people assume that that's all it is, but then you also tell us that Mick is focused. And I, I know that people, not unlike yourself, that, achieve this huge level of notoriety they don't get there accidentally they get there because of incredible focus yeah and hard work and um it's great that you you learned all that i mean it makes me wonder when you said it made you compose differently being in the room with your headphones off <laughs> must have been sort of a new experience for writing and um I actually remember you took me to a playback of Super Heavy. Um, at what did you say? Was that the Jim Henson? It was at Jim Henson Studios. It might have been called A and M. And um, yes, yeah. And I, th Mick was there, and Josh Stone was there. It was a little room, um, and I remember that, not unlike rock stars do, it was really loud. They played it back so loud. It's funny when you said you were coming out with chord progressions because it makes me wonder, Damien, you know, the feel on that that song, Miracle Worker, is reggae, straight up reggae. And uh, you think about reggae and raga and combining them, uh, such a nice vibe to have it be international. That's so great. I know that you're working internationally. You're doing something you mentioned before, in Dubai, you have a project in Dubai that I guess has been halted. Yeah, what, so are, what is going on in Dubai? In Dubai, you know, Expo, um, Expo actually promises a lot of stuff. I've been with them for almost now four to five months. And uh, it's probably the most exciting thing I've ever seen. And they have uh, uh, 200 different pavilions, different countries. Mm. And it's a culmination, a melting pot of you know, so many different things, knowledge, uh, understanding, and uh, for global consciousness. And so what we are trying to do, uh, I have, I'm working on a couple of projects. The first one is setting up a women's orchestra, hmm. um, a multicultural women's orchestra, setting up a whole new scoring studio in the hmm. campus with all the top equipment and a big scoring hall. I thought in the Middle East, uh, we, sh we should have something where Everybody can use from the west or from the east or south anywhere. You, and you want you want an artist though. It's very easy to fly from India or from London or from France. Mm -hmm. So it's just a Emirates flight away. Yeah. And an interesting possible and we set up all the satellite stuff so we can record remotely. Wow. And so that that's happening. We designed that and launched it. Is there a, an orchestra there in Dubai that understands the f routines of film music? Or are you teaching? Uh, the, most them? of them are trained. I think most of them are, are can sight read. We're just auditioning. We're just about to audition when this thing happened. Hmm. And we're going to resume probably in three, four months, hopefully, when all, everything settles down. It's been postponed for a year. So, yeah. That's you seem really dedicated to, to passing your knowledge on. It's very easy for someone to be successful and to just enjoy their life and do what they do. But you seem to be really focused on pushing your knowledge and, and your abilities out to others. Why is that so important to you? I think by giving you, you actually get. By giving knowledge or by facilitating things for other people, you get the joy which makes gives you reason to live. Because in this age, everything is, our soul is left behind and we're running so fast. And to catch a soul... Um, we learn things from from other people when we give, and even from the students. When I sometimes I'm fascinated by the way they sing, the way they play. Oh, one of the students from a conservatory was on CBS show, Lydia Nadasvaram. He was on the Ellen Show, and he won a million dollars. Wow! 
yeah you could you could check him out and so all that is super fascinating to see that if i had not bought that big piano and the teacher had not asked for something extraordinary like that and uh, this wouldn't have happened maybe you know and it would have been a compromise so by doing that stuff by signing that check buying the buying that piano on this conservatory and getting that teacher from you know from la mr chatterjee and by you know joining all this points you you get something beautiful and yeah that's easy in a way but also liberating at, at at some point of your life things are easy and it's better to do that time because they may not be as easy later it is so soulful though you're absolutely right that um i mean my first thought when i hear you say that is well doesn't that take away from your work and doesn't that take time away from you doing music or doesn't that take time away from your creativity but I really understand when you say that actually enhances it and it fulfills you in a way that I can only imagine improves in some way some of your perspectives and And your also work. you know you 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 start behaving uh, you start believing in human beings you start believing you trusting them they they just are miraculous after a point of them because that trust uh, is both ways complementary you know when you trust people the world trusts you and so my team is set up my my sister is the executive director of the school and we have these beautiful teachers who come from different countries from France Switzerland Armenia um uh, Scotland the US and they all in Chennai yeah, tanning <laughs> yes, and teaching and- And Los Angeles, I think you have a new student coming who after a long career in film yes. music is going to start at the beginning. Please. I wonder sometimes pupil craft. Yeah. Yes, right. Pupil craft <laughs> with Maestro Raman. Sometimes when certain artists get involved later in their careers after they've had great success in music and they start doing all the things you're doing which is contributing to projects and directing and writing the interest in being what they started a composer can sometimes be pushed aside a little bit and you end up doing lots of other things i know this intimately because uh often other things take you away and just being the person at the piano bench seems limited i wonder for you do you long for the opportunity to just close the door and score another film or do you think that's more occasional now for you or is it in the past for you as these projects unfold in front of you um when you talk about um le mask it just took me 18 days i took probably 3 three months of uh, pre-production and writing the script and it was supposed to be a 20 minute thing which became now 70 minutes because Mm-hmm. the the beauty of vr and everything so i'm not i have a team which look after looks after all the stitching and everything it was clearly edited even while scripting so i was not i didn't have so so many rushes because it's very expensive to shoot and so that's autopiloted the other movie i didn't want to direct because direction would take away all the interest uh, directing a 2d movie with going to multiple locations and having the whole thing mind would definitely take away from music so i didn't want to direct that and mm-hmm. it was a choice because it needs undivided attention and so that's how i'm playing my balance things which won't take my mind and i could dive into music anytime and so there is a director there was a director um vishwesh krishnamurthy he internalized the movie and he's living he lived with it for four years and he did the whole thing mm-hmm. and again amazing team uh, had a executive producer who take care of it and of course all the key moments i would go and intervene so i planned my thing very well so that it wouldn't take my music time away because music is my passion that's my everything and that would never happen and also when when you when you are in music too much you lose perspective when you get jaded so going away doing something and coming back to it feels refreshing it's like a reset button love you <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sometimes you just need a cleanse. You need a palate yeah. cleanse and start over. Yep. Yeah. So I'm not into gambling or drinking or anything because and for me this is a gamble is directing a movie maybe like Your life. a VR movie. Not not Your not life a, is a gamble. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um we we can't let you go without asking about your time with Michael Jackson. 
Yes. I think. What? What? Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Tell me. Tell me what it is. Oh, I just we we uh, we were we a little birdie told us that you uh, spent some time with Michael Jackson, and we'd love to hear that story. Yeah, I think when I said about influences, I forgot definitely forgot what Michael Jackson did to me because uh, for all of us who lived the eighties and in the early nineties, uh, definitely Jackson set the bar so high as a human being. Uh, at that time, doing so many charity concerts and things like that, and pushing the boundary for singing, production, music video, and as an artist. And so I met him. I didn't even meet. I, I think '99 there was a concert. I was invited to perform for the African or some kind of a concert in Munich. Which unfortunately I was supposed to meet him after the concert, but he got hit by a crane or something, hmm? and he was taken to the wow. hospital. So I missed meeting him. Hmm. Even though we performed, he wanted my song to be the encore, and which never happened, hmm. and it was a disaster. So that ended there. Years later, I think 10 years later, 2009, when the nominations were announced, I mean, you know, Sam Schwartz, my agent, he was like, AR, do you want to meet someone? So I wanted to pull a fast one and said, okay, let me meet Michael Jackson. So I just wanted to test, <laughs> see what my agent could do. Said, yeah, cool. I'll send him an email. So he had his friend Randy and, and Randy sent an email and uh, nothing happened. Oh, this was before the nominations. Yeah, this was during the promotion. Nothing happened. Nominations happens, and I go again to the uh, to LA to do promote, and and that time uh, Sam says, you know, Michael wants to meet you. Mm. I said my excitement went off because I'm not going to meet Michael because, or on one condition I'll meet him. If I win the Oscar. That time only Oscar, not, not Oscars. <laughs> I will meet him. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not going to meet him. I won't have the face to meet him. And so everything was arranged. Won the Oscar. And then I said, okay, you want to meet Michael Jackson now? Because you won the Oscar? Yeah, of course. So I was dropped. And Michael opens the door. It was so surreal. And there was Western classical music. <laughs> All the stuff playing. In. <laughs> and he was very sweet. It was like, he was like praising the way I spoke in the Oscars and the progression of Jeho and and so I was telling him how I grew up with this music and he also danced in show like I do everything from the heart and it was like a stroke of lightning suddenly when he started dancing. We were almost there for like two hours we were just talking, talking about um, and that's when he said we should do a song together like We Are The World and and all that stuff happened and then I met him once more that's when he got was preparing himself. I wrote a song for him, which uh, I thought he should, but I didn't have the guts to play to him, so I didn't <laughs> play to him. You, so, you're saying was this for the "This Is It" concert, or what was he preparing for? He was, yeah, he was preparing for the "This Is It" concert, yeah, and he was upbeat and and but the but the but the song I wrote was very defensive kind of song, so I didn't want to play to him at that mood i thought the aura would change and i pulled it back so did you guys ever work together on anything after all we were supposed to unfortunately but so that you had a plan in the works to to do a song or a some a, like a charitable something like that with a with a cause behind it that we, we talked about many things i didn't want to i didn't even take a photograph with him i didn't want to intimidate him because i know how shy he was hmm. and uh, so he introduced me to his kids and all that happened I think it's one of the most memorable moments of my life, I would say. I, wow. I, there's a full circle here, too, because you had had your success in India. You came to Los Angeles. You had your tremendous success here in Los Angeles. And I had, unfortunately, of course, didn't know some of the films you'd done and some of the work you'd done until Slumdog, like many Americans. And Sam Schwartz once told me, do you know what it's like to be with AR? He said, not only is he this soulful, 
incredibly spiritual, incredibly modest man. But if you drive somewhere with him and he gets out of the car, it's like <laughs> Michael Jackson has just arrived in some neighborhoods. People come out of stores. People get on the street. A.R. Raman is there. He's like the Michael Jackson of India. That's is that true, A.R.? Can you go anywhere without being talked to? Uh, I don't want to believe that because when I'm in the studio, <laughs> I want to be a nobody and that helps. Uh, it is true because um, when you do a concert, when you do and 50,000 people come in and 70,000 people come to a concert. Recently, we had a, I don't even forget which one. Like People just, uh, because I think music does that. It's not me. Uh, the music goes intermingles with the soul and it becomes part of their existence. And so that's one of the problems because when when that happens and even if you say something bad about the song which you wrote written, like uh, that could have been like that, they have become so different. So how can you say that, sir? Because we lived with that song and we lived with that score. And that's so beautiful because I, I tell my my uh, my team, I tell them that, you know, after you we do this and we, we let it out, it doesn't belong to us. You know, it has so much of tentacles it goes to so many people's lives and so we have to be so careful in and having a lens at everything so that it's beautiful and it's perfect well Love we it. are we are so lucky to have you and once again your answer showed how modest you are yes he is michael jackson and yes <laughs> they do go crazy when they see him and i can understand why because not only are you a wonderful human but your music has touched the world and the world has danced to it too. And I think the very first thing you said about bringing Indian music to, uh, to a Western audience is something you've achieved. I mean, Jai Ho was a huge hit and broke through. And now you hear Jay-Z and different rappers using Indian beats and samples, and you've really accomplished something. And I'm absolutely certain that Lim Musk is going to accomplish something for VR. In yeah. fact... I think Game I, can, changer. I can see the headline now. It's going to be ARVR. That's what we're going to be <laughs> oh, looking at. <laughs> wait a minute. ARVR is You better get up. that trademark right now. Kenny, how get lucky are we printing. and Carol to have AR Raman as our guest this week? Oh, this has been great. So AR, lucky. thank you so much for uh, coming on with us. and Staying up late. The, the interesting time zone, too, the 30 minutes... Your, your time zone is not at the top of the hour, which I didn't know existed. So I learned something there today, too, as well. Yeah, you're <laughs> half, halfway past the hour, but we really appreciate it, man. It's, for me, just a joy to see you again, even though you're on Zoom. I just loved our time together, and I love seeing you and love knowing how well you're doing and how beautiful the work is that you're contributing to the yep. world. So Please stay safe out there. Uh, a reminder so to our listeners to follow us uh, twitter at score the podcast instagram at score movie facebook score a film music documentary and send those questions in score the mailbox at epicleft.com robert's waiting patiently by the mailbox for those questions i can't and wait also stick around <laughs> stick around after today's show we're going to play you a little clip from spitfire audio so you can elevate your music robert take thank it away. you so much thanks to kevin Doucette who helped us out, set this up, and uh, our great thanks and love to A.R. Raman. Score the podcast. We're going to see We can't ya. wait to see your concert next year, A.R. We're going to be there Absolutely. here in L.A. We'll be, there. we'll be in the front row sure. cheering, mobbing you. <laughs> hey, Kenny, Carol, Kevin, A.R., thanks so much. We'll see you next week.